Hello, everybody. Welcome to day four of the Global Greenness and Agents Days. This day is dedicated to new tools and some new approaches. No, not really new approaches. Some important approaches that are too little known for tourism, um, especially regenerative and transformational tourism. We will start the day with a workshop, Reset and Recovery, led by Patricia Talau, the coordinator of Green Ocean Agents Training Program. Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Albert. Um, again, welcome everybody. And um, magandang umaga, magandang hapon, magandang gabi, or good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from all over the world and from here in Manila. <laughs> um, yes, um, if I could please ask my colleague to um, start our presentation. Thank you very much. And um, as I said, again, welcome to the fourth and last day of the Global Green Destination Days. And we truly appreciate your support and um, really hope that the conference has been a great learning experience for everyone so far. Um, today, we start with the Reset and Recovery Workshop, which showcases the SDG and Tourism Assessment Tool as a first step in emerging as better destinations as we slowly come back to a new normal. Um, I'm Patisse, um, I'm Green Destinations Training Program Coordinator, and I will be your moderator for today, together with Malu of the START Program and members of the GD Training Team. It is our honor and pleasure to bring this tool finally closer to everyone. This tool is, um, uh, sorry, this workshop is a sneak preview of the master class on reset and recovery that we are developing and will be launching next year. So over the past decades, um, we know that tourism has been marred by many, many challenges. Our industry has been dealing with over-tourism and over-consumption, and in the age of social media and bucket list travels, we have recognized um, the struggles of promoting tourism as a tool for sustainable development. And when COVID-19 hit the globe, the world came to a stop. Borders were closed and travel was heavily restricted in a way that it hasn't been for many, many, many years. But then let's put this into perspective. We know that international tourism has experienced very rapid growth in the last decades and year after year. We continue to see unprecedented increases in international and domestic visitor arrivals. And despite global events that have negatively affected our industry, like the 2003 SARS pandemic and the 2008 global economic crisis, tourism has always managed to bounce back and recover almost immediately. But the pandemic paints a very different story for us, as you can see here. Not only are we dealing with so much loss, but recovery is also taking so much longer than we all are hoping for. And um, most countries recognized and approached the COVID-19 pandemic as a health crisis, and rightly so. However, all um, available evidence suggests that the COVID-19 um, originated actually in environmental issues. And COVID-19 is considered as a zoonotic disease. It's a disease transmitted between animals and humans. And before the pandemic, experts have already warned us of the dangers of increased infectious diseases such as COVID-19 as a result of biodiversity and habitat loss. The pandemic also is now being considered as a social political crisis and is an equality challenge for many countries. It really highlighted the uneven distribution of goods, burdens, opportunities, and resources. And we have to realize that global crises are very much interlinked. The climate crisis, for example, as was discussed yesterday in the many panel sessions that we had, it also goes beyond as an environmental crisis. And how these crises impact countries, regions, destinations, and places all depend on the scale of damage, the type of crisis, whether they're political, economic, social, environmental, or technological, as well as the current state of the affected area. And this deals with their preparedness to handle crisis, current operating conditions, and other crises 
that they might be already experiencing. Crises bring disturbances to many industries and places and can cause a series of negative effects. When travel was essentially banned, we all saw drops in revenues, led to business closures, rise in unemployment, thus reducing tourism capacity and impending recovery, um, leading to further drops in GDP and eventually slowed development. It affected the wider industry, but also tourism at the local level. This cycle, however, can be prevented with appropriate preparation and management plans in place. And as the pandemic highlighted, as well as the many challenges and crises that we are currently experiencing, destination resilience is also increasingly becoming a primary concern for many. But what does this really mean? In a nutshell, it talks about the capacity of communities and businesses to survive, absorb the impact, and transform, this, and transform despite challenges. That said, it is not only about dealing with crisis and disasters in terms of um, crisis and disaster management, but also preparing destinations to deal with and manage the impending tourism impacts. The pandemic may have um, brought the industry down, but not with a multitude of opportunities to become a truly sustainable industry. Knowing that tourism can bounce back quickly once travel restrictions are lifted, we have a massive opportunity right now to redirect tourism growth and development towards a truly sustainable and resilient industry. And hearing from the different panelists the past few days has been really truly, truly inspiring as we pave the way towards a better tourism industry. And um, what we have for you today is how we, as Green Destinations, can help and guide um, destinations towards reset and recovery. We all know that there is no one solution and there is no one way to do it, but this tool helps you as destinations to determine your path towards reset and recovery. So without further ado, I give the floor to Malu Mayorga to take us through how this tool can work for you. Thank you, Patis. Very inspiring words. Um, I will use Patis' words to talk a little about how to redirect tourism growth towards a truly sustainable and resilient industry. The focus of the second part of this workshop will be to talk a little about New about, about new the, the new program that Green Destination is launching during this event, the START program. And we, we want you to get more familiarized with it and understand how this set of tools can help you better plan and develop a strategy to reach your sustainability ambitions and build a more resilient community. So let me just, yeah. Um, and for those who couldn't attend to our welcome panel, I will briefly introduce you to the START program. Uh, let's start by analyzing why uh, START program. So START stands out for support tools for the assessment and reset of tourism. And in this program, we encourage destination managers to start looking more closely into their community, uh, understanding in depth the context and backgrounds in which they are inserted in. And we help them uh, start rethinking about the way they do, uh, they do tourism today. Um, and what are the benefits this program can provide to destination managers? First of all, the program will help destinations to create their own roadmaps toward a more meaningful tourism. It also assists in identifying the best opportunities, weaknesses, and strengths of destinations using monitoring and forecasting tools. Uh, it helps uh, destinations to understand what is the situation and how are they managing their tourism by providing diagnosis tools and detailed reports. And these reports are also very, very useful for showcasing sustainability practices and outputs for residents, the public sector, or even visitors. And we also want to build a solid base of knowledge and good practices so destinations can lead the way towards, uh, sustain towards sustainability and why not regeneration. And just to recap uh, a little the structure of the whole toolkit, 
Here you can have a clear picture of all tools we have available at the moment. But we must say that this is an ongoing program. So our idea is to keep feeding the toolkit with new tools developed by our internal team, but also adding external tools from our partners. Uh, I will not extend myself in explaining all the tools because we have a limited time. But if you want to know them in detail, uh, you can always get in touch with us or look for them in our webpage that is also brand new that we are also launching over here. So we invite you all to, to check it out and to, to go to our webpage and, and look for all the tools that we have available. But basically, uh, as our step into, we have the SDG and Tourism Assessment and Reset Tool, which is a super detailed survey that helps destination managers self-assess their destinations uh, sustainability performance and find the tools that best, su best suits uh, their needs. And after taking the survey, you will have a much clearer idea of what are your next steps and where you should concentrate your efforts to start assessing your sustainability ambitions. And then we separate all the tools in five different toolkits. So the first one we have is the interactive assessment that is can the conformity uh, of your destinations management to the DSTC and green destination standards. Then we have the benchmarking reporting. This tool helps destinations to adopt KPIs to benchmark report and monitor their performance, uh, comparing them with neighboring destination or references destinations. Then we have the climate reset toolkit that addresses climate related issues. And we have the destination sustainability assessment that help you understand a variety of risks and opportunities related to sustainable tourism. I think this one is the most comprehensive uh, toolkit because you can choose themes and you can personalize as you want. And finally, but not least, we have the exchange and education learning, uh, which is the base uh, and embrace all, all, all the other tools. Um, we want to provide in this toolkit courses, workshops, uh, webinar, training, uh, learning tools, so it can give you a base to start um, applying the tools. Uh, during the welcoming session, I don't know if everyone over here could, uh, could attend to it, uh, we invited you to fill out a, our start self-assessment, which is a short version of our SDG and tourism assessment tool uh, that we designed especially for this workshop. Uh, we, ha we had respondents for all over the globe, and we, we're going to use this survey today to explain you better about the start functionalities. And as I said, the idea was to get you more familiarized with the functionalities of this tool in a much faster way because the long version takes around one hour to be completed and to show you how this free and universal tool can help destination managers to, in taking action. Um, and I find it interesting to start explaining why we adopted the SDG as the base of this Pathfinder tool. First of all, uh, we all know that the sustainable development goals are the most widely accepted framework we have today to address sustainability issues. In that way, it's easier to introduce tools uh, and steps and taking into, consideration, uh, taking into consideration this approach. It is also an approach that most destination managers come to us looking for. So they want to know more about it and how to implement it in their destinations, uh, focus it in the tourism sector. And the SDG framework also gives us a pretty clear overview of our context, mainly because it highlights most of the issues that we are facing nowadays. But, and I think there is always a, a but, we have to be super careful on using it, mainly because as mentioned earlier by Patiz, we need to understand that the crisis we are passing through can't be analyzed separately, but rather as a one. So we need to have in our minds that all SDGs are linked. And when you work with one, with one of them, uh, we are actually also working with others. So we need to, to, to look into the SDGs into a wider perspective, into something that is connected. 
And to contextualize a little and to bring some insights that were taken out of, uh, of the survey that we developed during this event, I want to share you the survey outcomes, which is super enriching and let us emphasize the importance of understanding the reality of your destination, uh, the importance of using tools uh, to help you better assess this reality and what you can do to overcome the, uh, the face of challenges. So this group basically mainly is composed by people from all uh, around the globe in 17 different countries, mostly by Europeans with 37% more or less, followed by Asian Americans with uh, 25% and Africans with 12%. And we analyzed super quickly the responses and we, bought, we brought to this presentation some of them that provided us with good insights and good questions. And by analyzing the question number 11, and we saw something that was kind of a surprise. Uh, the question number 11 talks about the local quality of well being enhanced by tourism. And the 17 extends to how the residents are involved in the tourism uh, strategies in, in the destination. Um, we could see that indeed there are destinations working to enhance the local life quality. However, it was a surprising that there are so many destinations lagging behind. And if we analyze the chart number 11 together with the number 17, we can conclude that there are still gaps where it comes to including residents and the local community in the tourism planning and implementation. And this takes us to reflect upon how can we be a sustainable industry, the tourism industry, if we left people behind? What is lacking? How can we better assess these issues? How can we bring a um, local community uh, together to help us developing um, a more sustainable sector? And when it comes to analyzing the questions number 15 that talks about supporting business to adopt sustainability practices and 16 that talks about the prevention of over tourism, we could see that most destinations are already uh, addressing uh, over tourism issues, but not all of them. And this made us reflect on how are we preparing the return of tourism. Now that we had some time to stop and rethink how are we planning our future actions? What is lacking in planning and implementation? Are we involving all of our stake stakeholders in, in, in this return? Are we supporting them and also adopting sustainability practices? How are we doing that? What are the gaps that we have nowadays? And how can we fill, start filling the, those gaps? Well, these were some, some thoughts that we could extract from, from this short survey. And those questions can be super beneficial when planning the management of a certain destination. And this was the reason why we created the SDG and tourism assessment tool, to help you find the right questions, to help you better assess those questions and also help you answer them. And how does this tool works? So you're going to have to fill out a survey, a super detailed survey. And once we receive all your answers, the team will compress uh, all the outcomes on, and, and the work on a feedback report. And what information we will provide in this feedback? So first of all, we're going to rank the overall score of your destination, as well as your score uh, per SDG. In that way, you can better understand um, what are the weaknesses and strength your destination have? And we took an, as, a, as an example, one of the respondents of the survey, of the event survey. And he, uh, his overall worth was 42 out of 76. And the analyzed X, uh, SDG scores were, um, were these that I uh, exposed in, in this slide. So we basically, in this, in this survey, we basically analyze it, uh, these SDGs. And for this particular survey respondent, he got 50%, for instance, in the number three, 
50% uh, also in the number four, 63% in, in the SDG number 10, and etc. So here he can, he can have a clear uh, picture of how he is assessing and how he is developing um, his destination regarding the SDGs analyzed. And after showcasing the score, we provide a detailed description about all tools we, we recommend. And in this case, we suggested the manager having a close look into some tools that I will explain now. Uh, the first one uh, that we suggest him taking was the business sector scan that in this case will help them better assess the SDGs number four and number 10. Uh, just just at, at, as a, um, a reminder, uh, this tool can assess other, um, other SDGs, but in this case, for this uh, particular um, survey that we developed, especially for this event, um, the SDG that, it, that this um, tool assess is the SDG 4 and 5. And this tool helps you to understand if your tourism-related business um, has adopted the most important practices in sustainability tourism. And it's linked to the three, um, three uh, mentioned questions. We also suggestion them taking the GD rapid assessment and that can help managers better uh, understand their issues regarding the SDG number 11 and 12. And this tool offers a rapid assessment on all subjects of the GSTC and GG standard. So it gives you a clear picture of your conformity uh, with the analyzed standards of Green Destination and, and GSTC. Uh, in, this, in this slide, we bring the climate re risk assessment that can help in the assessment of relevant climate impacts and risks such as marine fluids, uh, heat stress, um, risk of wildfires, melting glaciers, and etc. And in this case, the suggested tools uh, the suggested tool link uh, with the SDG number 11, 14, and 15. And last but not least, we suggested the destination uh, level benchmark report tool that helps destination managers uh, in identifying the suitable KPIs for their reality in their destination. Uh, this will give you uh, and the destination manager actually an insight in how uh, their destination is doing in comparison with references destinations and neighboring destinations and also can be used as a monitor tool to keep you on track or uh, on your sustainability ambitions. Just to close, I think it's worth mentioning that one tool can help you better assess different issues. Uh, as you can see, different SDGs, different questions, different um, problems and challenges that you have inside your, your destination. Because as we mentioned earlier, they are all interconnected. So once you, change, once you uh, start addressing a particular SDG, for example, you are automatically uh, also assessing and, and developing and managing others. So now it's your turn. We encourage you in taking the SDG and tourism assessment tool. Uh, it's a free and universal tool. Uh, we think it's super worth taking it. Um, so choose a quiet place, a place where you can um, um, use an hour, an hour and a half to, to fill all the survey. Uh, try to be the most um, serious and you can because it's it's a super nice tool and it's a super comprehensive tool and we will be sharing the link uh, to the survey in the chat so you can just click and go straight over there and uh, start filling out and start uh, assessing and and start um, learning a little bit about the context in which you are inserted the, the opportunities that you have inside the your destination, uh, the weaknesses you have, the strengths you have, um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Malu. I am Andrea, a GD training member, and allow me to share with you what all this now mean in our quest to reset and recovery. 
The 17 Sustainable Development Goals are a new goal for action by all countries developed and developing in a global partnership. From the survey outcomes, we see that some destinations are already far ahead, but some are far behind. If you're asking yourselves, how are we doing as a destination? This can let us to a simple, uh, sorry, this can be just a simple tool that helps you answer that. The last three days of this conference showcased many potentials of how tourism can become a better industry for the planet. The SDG and tourism assessment tool allows you to determine your options as we all work together to reap the benefits of sustainable development. This way, we prevent the return of over tourism and lessen consumptions in the tourism industry. Now, I will let my colleague Jennifer speak. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, as demonstrated, sustainability is key in tourism recovery and is one of the key policy priorities being predominantly discussed in industry. In establishing or reshaping our current tourism policies, we also have to consider changes in tourism demand. In the short term, we see the rise of domestic travel. Long haul traveling will definitely be the last to come back. There is also stronger demand for sustainable experiences. With experts saying COVID-19 is here to stay, more health and safety protocols are continuously being implemented. There will also be a need for clear communication strategies to inform travellers and businesses about what is healthy and safe to do within all possible extents. Digitalization, contactless technology and many innovative initiatives will be increasingly more important in tourism and resilience and recovery to ensure that we don't resort to pre-pandemic practices. Patisse will now round off the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And um, with everything said, now we'd like to ask you, where are you heading? What changes are you making? How will you take part in a better tourism industry? Thank you so much for following our workshop. And now we open the floor for questions. Do you have any questions? You can write them on the chat if that, um, if that would be helpful for you. While we wait, maybe it's um, good to ask um, either Malu um, from START or even Albert. Um, one of the tools that, is, um, that was presented earlier as well was the benchmarking report. Um, and maybe you can share with us how um, benchmarking can help destinations and what value does this add to, um, uh, to one's sustainability journey? Albert, do you want me saying? Do you want to take the lead? How should we do? <laughs> well, I can answer. <laughs> Actually, the, the benchmark reporting, it's, it's one of our, um, how can I say? It's one of the most promising uh, tools that we have because it allows you to choose the KPIs in which, in, in which you want to work. So it helps you like analyzing which KPI is most, is most suitable for your destination. And after uh, choosing our, all these KPIs, we will uh, analyze uh, in comparison with neighboring destination or references destinations, uh, how your destination is developing in, in, in this KPI. So for instance, um, we can choose a KPI of, I don't know, land use perhaps. And then you, we analyze uh, the land usage of all neighboring destination or reference destinations to see how your destination is developing and managing uh, the land use. So it's, it's a quite interesting um, um, report and tool to better understand where are you in comparison with with your with your competitors, let's not say competitors because I don't think we are competing over here, but with references, destinations, and neighboring destinations. And what is in, in, interesting is that you can adopt this um, report and this tool uh, biannually or annually to monitor 
how you are developing uh, regarding this, this, these KPIs. So it's a super interesting um, tool and it can help a lot of destinations to better assess their, their issues, uh, to better know how uh, they can implement changes and to know where to focus in. Very well said, Malu. Thank you. We have a question for you, um, another one for you. Um, please, could you give a, a further explanation on the graphics on questions 11 and 17? Yeah, sure. Let's, let me just go back into it and then we can analyze more visually. So the idea of, of these charts was analyzing a little bit the, the, the context in which, in, in which we are inserted in, in this um, workshop. So in the beginning of, of this event, we, we invited you to filling out uh, the survey, the short survey that we developed so you can, could get more familiarized with, with our SDG tool. Um, and then we, we, came up, we came out with some outputs because I mean, other than uh, having a really nice report on what you, what are your weaknesses, strengths, or, and opportunities? This tool also gives us the opportunity of analyzing the context, analyzing all the respondents, and seeing how how the context of tourism is is developing. So let's let me go. It, it is this question eleven or the, the sixteen? Which one? Question eleven and seventeen. Okay, okay so let's slides. let's go to to the slides. So here we can see that in the chart eleven, uh, it's about is the local quality of life strongly enhanced by tourism in your destination? And we see that uh, we have like a split respondent. So most of the respondents said that uh, either they are not, um, the, 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 um, the quality of life of tourism is not, um, the tourism don't enhance the quality of life of, of residents and which is the, the answer zero and then we have the four that is yes uh, tourism truly enhanced the local quality of life and here we can see that most of the respondents said um, uh, that they are in between zero and two which is we, we come which make us reflect upon why not uh, what is happening over here um, why the quality of life is not strongly enhanced by tourism because it should be i mean we are we are talking about tourism we are talking about uh working together with with the community working together with the place with the locality so the, the local quality of life should be enhanced and when we analyze the 17 uh our residents involved in the tourism um strategy we see that most of the respondents said that no they are not uh involved and perhaps this could be uh the reason why i mean uh, we should uh, keep in our minds that to develop a destination, we need to hear from the local community. We, we need to, to know their, their issues, what they need, if they are happy with the, the tourism that is made there, if they feel, um, if they feel um, represented by the tourism over there. So this is a truly nice um, comparison in between these two charts because something is lacking over here. We have a, a gap over here to hear more from the community, to, to know more their will, uh, what they want, what they, they don't like about uh, the tourism in, in the destination and so on. So I hope I, I could um, talk a little bit about and explain a little bit about the charts. Thank you. We also have another question here um, in regards to the learning toolkits. What um was wondering about some more information about the exchange education and learning toolkit and what kinds of things are in there? Well, these, uh, as I said, um, the whole structure of the toolkit is is uh, is is an ongoing pro pro process. So the idea is also it's always adding new new tools and new courses and new things so this is under under construction and the idea of the exchange in educational learning is to provide uh, destination managers or any related uh, tourism uh, business to learn more about um, 
how how we do business what is the best practices so inside this 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 tool we put we we add uh some external uh partners courses um and also the trainings that we develop inside uh here in in green destination so for instance i think patis could could also explain a little bit uh, more about our our um, trainings uh, and courses that we give inside the, the Green Destinations. Yes, thank you, Malu. Um, currently for GD training, we have um, our introduction course to sustainable tourism, which is sustainable tourism uh, destination management. We just launched it last month. And we also have um, another introductory course, which is um, the top 100 training, but that one is exclusively for the top 100 applicants but we are also in the process of creating um trainings that would suit um the needs of whoever um wants them or whoever needs them and uh yeah so we work with we're working with gd representatives to also um transform these trainings not just for online components but also for on-site and making sure that they are adaptable to the needs of the participants as well um yeah, yeah. um next question um we have um from tim uh quick question and apologies if you have explained this already are the tools publicly and free for uh for free available for anyone to use well we have as as the idea is to be a one-stop shop toolkit we have uh tools uh, from all for from, from every everyone so um, the idea is mixing over here free tools and also paid tools to to better uh, assess everyone um so yes we have free tools for instance the sdg and tourism assessment which is the survey is um completely for free you can have access to it and and the feedback is also free so it's a really nice uh uh tool to to enter the the program and yeah we have some free tools some paid tools so it's a mix up of everything thank you and possibly um our last uh no we have last two questions and then mm -hmm. if there are any more questions we can probably have them during the breakout session um but kirsi asked here um how do the results of the survey relate to act to the awards and certification program of green Desk? um well the um, let me go to to the page where where we explain the the feedback so the idea as i said is after uh, filling out the survey we will provide you with this feedback and the feedback uh, will have uh, mainly the score that you that you took out of this survey uh, and the the general score and also the score per sdg so here you can already have access to to so what what are your strengths and, and and weaknesses and some opportunities and then throughout the um, the feedback we provide you with suggested tools so um depending on your your strengths and your opportunities we suggest you taking uh, some particular tools and yeah this this could be related to to the to the program because it helps you like finding uh the best way to to overcome your climate changes yeah your 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 challenges the climate crisis and how to better manage all all your your destinations um issues Thank you, Malu. Um, and as a last question, is the Green Destinations Rapid Assessment report same as the report generated from the SDG tool? If not, is there another set of indicators being used for the rapid assessment? So the rapid, let me go back to the structure. So the rapid assessment is basically um, a, um, a rapid assessment, a, a really quick assessment to, to see your conformity with the GSTC and the GD standard. So it helps you better analyze if you if your uh, management um, is in conformity with all this with all the 10 standards that Green Destinations uh, and GSTC have. So it helps you analyzing uh, uh, an holistic overview 
on how uh, you can better assess uh, the standards. And yeah, hope um, I, I could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we just have one question and I think it's just important and we have like one minute left <laughs> before we move on to the next session. So I think let's put it in. Um, the KPI structure you are using, are they directly connected to GD's criteria or is this a new KPI system that you are developing? Um, it's, I mean, we, we are talking about a, a, a toolkit, um, a program that is inside the Green Destination. So obviously it will have like some things uh, similar to, to Green Destinations, but the, but the idea over here is choosing KPIs that are most suitable for each one of the destinations. So we don't have like a standardized uh, KPIs that we, that we um, send for every destination. We're gonna sit with you and understand your needs, understand your context and choose the KPIs that are most suitable for, for each one of the, for the destinations that we are working with. So yes, it's, it's super tailor-made, it's super personalized. And of course we have some links with the green destinations because we are inside of green destinations here, but, but yeah, um, we, we, we try to keep it more personalized and try to see um, the issues of, of a particular destinations because we know that when, when we compare like a destination that is already super developed with a, with a destination that, that it's like starting to, to develop them, themselves in, in, in the tourism sector, we know that KPI should be different. So we need, we, we need to look differently to both sides and, and understand their needs and understand their issues and, and try to, to develop uh, um, a, a super personalized uh, tool that can, can help you better assess your issues in the reality. All right, thank you very much, Malou. And thank um, you guys. yeah, so what you just witnessed is really a small sneak preview of what we have in store for you. Um, for the master class for reset and recovery, which we will be launching next year. So um, I hope that kind of in, inspired you um, in a way, uh, yeah, for, for reset and recovery. So let me just introduce a little bit um, our next session as we move on. And um, yeah, so we have uh, repeatedly heard about so many crises that our industry and the world is currently facing and that it really, um, it really calls for urgent action, but not only from the tourism industry, but also for the other sectors you know, and us individually. And we are faced with massive challenges for our planet. And how do we get into the right mindset for this? And what values should we hold in order for us to um, truly change and yeah, change the way that we live in our, in our earth? In the next session, I hope this not only inspires you, but also steer new ideas. Um, so the session is moderated by our amazing partner who has also um, helped us uh, develop one of our training courses. She is uh, Bibiana Kala. And her experience in sustainable tourism management began over 20 years ago. As a professional anthropologist, she examined the tourism effects from a social cultural perspective. And since then, her interest in tourism seen as an agent of transformation captured her attention and she immersed herself in the study and practice of sustainable and regenerative tourism. Today, as a co-founder of Good to Great Tourism and a GD representative in Canada, she continues supporting the industry through educational programs and projects focused on collaborations and synergies so that tourism can lead to thriving communities and flourishing environments while providing high quality experiences for the visitors and the residents alike. So Bibiana, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Patiz. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm very happy to be here, uh, and I hope you all are very excited uh, to this um, session. I am, personally. So thanks, Patiz, again for that introduction. And um, I would like to uh, start by thanking Green Destinations for giving us the opportunity of hosting today's sessions and for letting us share some insights about the synergies between sustainable, regenerative, and transformational tourism. 
Um, but before welcoming our first panel, I would like to remind everybody um, that after the presentation, we will have some breakout rooms and we can continue the conversation with the with the speaker, uh, with the speakers. And remember that all the questions are welcome. Please post them on the uh, in the chat, and we'll uh, we will do our best to include them. So now I'm going to start sharing my screen with the presentation. Uh, this was a collaborative uh, work for these three organizations that I'm going to introduce right now. Um, and they uh, put together this presentation. So I will introduce the three speakers while uh, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, just one second. Okay, I think we're ready. Um, uh, so uh, I would like to introduce now our three speakers uh, for this panel. Manuel Prunier from Good to Great Tourism, Anna Alaman from the Region Lab, and Tanner Colton from Transformational Travel Council. Manuel Prunier is a co-founder of Good to Great Tourism, a social enterprise that works locally and internationally through the co-creation of solutions to enable tourism as an agent of positive change. She's also one of the Green Destinations representatives in Canada. She has a passion for harnessing the potential of tourism to improve lives, empower communities, enhance cultures and protect the environment. Much of her work has been community-led and founded on the principles that tourism should improve destinations and inspire tourists to bring positive change to the places they visit, to their own lives and to the world generally. She holds a Master of Science in International Development, a GSTC Certificate in Sustainable Tourism, and is a recognized transformational designer and ally of the Transformational Tourism Council. Anna Alaman is a co-founder of the Region Lab for Travel, a platform that facilitates the transition towards regenerative development in the tourism sector. Anna is also the founder and CEO of Open Eyes India since 2011. She is a lecturer and educator in Barcelona in responsible tourism design, social enterprises, and introduction to regenerative development. Since 2020, she has been supporting and mentoring women to start with the more clarity and with more clarity and structure their social enterprises, creating a unique systemic business model design approach. And Tanner Colton is the director of design and innovation at the Transformational Travel Council, a collective of global tourism stakeholders founded in 2015 dedicated to cost-driven initiatives that are centered on behavior change, traveling and living more mind mindfully, and fostering positive holistic change at a traveler, host, and destination level. Tanner is also the co-owner of the community-based tourism company Travel Life Adventures. Tanner is passionate about travel being a lever for both healing and regeneration, as well as a venue for transformations of all kinds. An outdoor enthusiast and lifelong traveler, Tanner understands the power that experiences can have on people and the planet. Now I would like to give the floor to Manuel Brunier, who will start this presentation that uh, this organization have put together. So the floor is yours, uh, Manuel. Thank you, Bibiana, and uh, hello, everybody. In the previous presentation on the START program, Malou mentioned that some tools will be offered by external providers. This will include, over time, regenerative and transformational tourism tools in collaboration with other organizations, such as Region Lab and the Transformational Tourism Council. You may wonder what this is all about. In this presentation, we will tell you more about these two concepts and how they intermingle with uh, sustainability. And in the next session, four Green Destination representatives will present case studies that actually include regenerative tourism principles. The tourism industry 
has been designed to encourage growth to the extent that it has become an extractive industry that uses destinations, their residents, and their environments to serve it, rather than seeking to benefit them. Tourism creates waste, pollution, and so much environmental damage that some sites have had to be closed to be able to recover. Tourism is responsible for about 8% of the world's carbon emissions. Many destinations are also suffering from over-tourism and from cultural deterioration and exploitation to the extent that some communities have actually become hostile to visitors. As a result, the quality of the tourism experience is spoiled both for the visitors and for host communities. Despite all our hard work on sustainability in tourism and in other domains, we are now reaching an existential threshold, not just for tourism, but for much of human activity with the climate crisis, the loss of biodiversity, and the emergence of new pandemics, among others. We realize that to save life as we know it on the planet, we need to do more than just mitigate negative impacts and more than just try to maintain a status quo that is no longer a guarantor of a healthy planet. As one of the main world industries, tourism has a major role to play. The planet is in a bad way and needs healing so that the environment and its inhabitants can thrive again. For this, we need a transformation of our relationship with nature and with the planet. Instead of considering ourselves as separate from nature, we need to realize that we're actually part of it just like any other living being on Earth. We need to stop looking at nature just as a resource to be exploited. If we start considering nature as an actual stakeholder and wonder what would nature say when we work on tourism development, healing and regeneration could begin. One tool to consider for this transformation towards regeneration is transformational travel. Holidays are a time when people are more receptive to learning, challenging themselves, adopting new ideas and changing attitudes. This is one of the reasons why transformational tourism is gaining in popularity. It has the potential to induce this regenerative shift in mindset going from exploiting to caring and leading to practices that go beyond sustainability to actually heal the planet. For instance, surfing holidays can be designed in a way that makes surfers fall in love with the ocean because become aware of its fragility and wanting to protect it instead of just seeing it as a resource providing a background for their sporting activities. They may then also become more aware of their impact on the environment in their daily life. With the regenerative shift, the aim is to push sustainability further. We continue to maintain and protect. And in addition, we also attempt to foster restoration, regeneration, and help the planet thrive again. How do we do this, will you ask? We can ask, we can start by asking questions to see if our tourism actions are extractive or regenerative. Here are some, are some great questions inspired by Paul Hawken. Does the tourism action restore the environment or degrade it? Does it increase global warming or decrease it? Does it enhance human well being or diminish it? Does it serve human needs? or does it manufacture human wants? Does it reduce poverty or expand it? Does it heal the future or does it steal the future? As you can see, regenerative tourism is not a new form of tourism, but a different lens 
that complements that of sustainability and takes it further. It introduces an approach based on interactions, relationships, and system thinking, systemic thinking. This means that when we work towards achieving a particular SDG, we cannot do this in a silo. We need to look at the impact this may have on other SDGs. For instance, could the SDG about promoting sustainable economic growth have a negative impact on SDGs that are dealing with the climate and the environment? In this sense, Green Destinations has already taken steps toward a systemic approach with the Green Destination Standard, which is actually based on themes rather than on a simple list of criteria, and also with a start program, as we saw in the previous presentation. If we look at uh, the diagram by Anna Pollock on this slide, we see that the regenerative lens is based on biology and living systems rather than on mechanics and industry. It is all about creating conditions for life and all living beings to thrive. So really, we are moving from business as usual, where tourism causes damage, to trying to neutralize negative impacts, which is the sustainability level, and to tourism becoming a force for actual improvements and regeneration. When adopting this mindset, we go beyond delivering value mainly for shareholders and for industry stakeholders. And tourism brings net benefits also for communities, their environment, and the planet in general. Tourism then becomes a force for good and for regeneration. I will now hand over to Anna Alaman of the Region Lab to take us deeper into the regional mindset exploration. Hello everyone, good evening from, from India. Um, my name is Anna Laman and I am the founder of the Region Lab for Travel. And I will follow what Manuel has been talking about with the terminology of uh, regenerate, what means regenerate. And if we see in the definition, it's about to give new life or energy too. So here is, we put the focus on giving life or energy too. So we are not sustaining, we are giving life. We are, with tourism, we are putting energy in that destination to make it more alive. So we are not sustaining, we are going beyond. But what that means on the generative tourism, so here we can see in the terminologies what um, in the thesis that my colleague also has been um, developing and studying, here we are going to just focus about the importance of the encounter of humans with ourselves, with the other. It means a destination, it can be, and then and the nature. So here the encounter, it's really the focus as well for changing mindset. And also we can, we can go deeper into the pillars that um, sustainability, we have seen that there are usually three pillars, economic, social, cultural, and sometimes socio, uh, sorry, cultural, and then the environmental. For regenerative tourism, we go to deeper with the next slide, we can see the six pillars of regenerative development. And we have to always say that is a design process. Regenerative development has a focus on design process. So here we add the governance, the political point of view, and also the spiritual, but I like to call it like the world view. What are the lens, which lens, the traveler, the founder of that organization, the team, the communities in which lens they are seeing the world, the world view. So these two pillars we can see are added and that this graphic, it's, it's good to see if we can we could compare with sustainability a little bit to see how um, regenerative development embrace sustainability, always embrace sustainability, but also add, we can say that worldview of the lens of the, of the person and the encounter in the, the person in the destination. And, but okay, and you will see how 
how we can make this, you know, in make it practical, make it pragmatic, because honestly, it's a very abstract concept, and I know it can be difficult to be to, to make it grounded. So how we can really move towards regenerative development. So I'm going to give three examples, or let's say three areas, three pillars, where we can move. We can move through individual or collective vocation. I mean, we have to see that when a community really awakens to be unique, it taps into a potency that comes from operating very authentically from the core of who it is. And potency, the potential can be really drained now away if it's only focused on one individual and not in a collective way. Vocation is a meaning, it's a call, it's a call to action, it's a sense of direction, yeah? And every city, every destination, every company, every organization, every person has a vocation. Could we, through regenerative development, could we really await that vocation and really make that destination go into, um, how could be the higher expression of one destination? How we can really see that legacies that have been fathered away, um, but still has resonance for people? How, how could inspire the ancestral traditions to the people that are coming to visit? And how iconic events and people, what histories do people need to say? That can be translated into the same, how we can develop workshops for our team members, for our communities, that they are really aligned with what they say, what they do, and what they are you know, working with the, and aligned with the planet needs. Um, I'll give you an example. Our company a year and a half ago, you know, from the pandemic, we, we shut down and one of the well, it's, it's a whole. So one of the exercises we did with our team was a alignment of the team members with the future of the organization to make sure the transition is also aligned with them. After a year and a half later, we are still waiting. They are still, they are still you know, waiting when we are going to open the borders because they are aligned with the purpose of the organization. So aligning the purpose of the people with the purpose of the organization, with the planet needs, is looking for regenerative development. Another area is about system thinking. We have been talking about system thinking, and I wanted to make it very pragmatical here. Why if we don't, the SDGs has been really moving and really benefiting some destinations, but we should really move farther and deeper, and sometimes it's been misused. So here, in order to make it more in a systemic way, um, we are looking more into shifting our development paradigm away from the current sectoral approach of which social and economic and ecological development are seen as separate apart, as seen as fragmented. And here we impl in place that economies and societies are seen as a part of the biosphere. We cannot have society, healthy society and healthy economies if we don't really have a healthy ecosystem. So could we see that SDGs and be as the base, we can see the, the biosphere as an ecosystem, as the base to really have a healthy economic and society um, as part also of SDG and see it as a part of the regeneration. Um, we are maybe genetically distinctive, but we are connected. And as these fungus in the picture, they share resources and information very, very, very quickly. So us and the SDGs, they are all connected in the same way. And going to the, going to the three relationships, which also um, are part of this alignment in regeneration, what we say this collective and individual vocation of relation with myself, with the other, and relation with nature, and here we can see this when we see this in, in travel, it usually happens when there is an encounter between the guest and the host. And here it's more about the ability to develop and show the essence, the spirit. You know, every person has their own uniqueness to show in the world and through a process of really self-realization. So how we can really um, make the contribution to the world through our trip. And here, one company could ask questions as, why are you traveling to this destination? What is your purpose to travel to this destination? Yeah, so, and what is the relationship with the organization that is organizing this, this tour? And this organization is aligned with what the planet needs, with that, those SDGs that their destination, for example, needs. It's really aligned with those, those 
yeah, those problems, those planets need a lead in the destination. So here, um, when we see that can be the encounter can be between the guest and the host, but also can see between the, the entrepreneur, the company, and the destination, how we can really see that uh, triple effect. And I think this is very, very important because what we have seen with sustainability in the last years is a lack of alignment and that we call greenwashing. Yeah, and we all know that it can be really uh, going to that way. So regenerative development, we I see this a clarity, you know, deeper um, focus on really making that alignment stronger. So we don't we don't go and we don't uh, get to avoid this greenwashing effect that we are we are counting the alignment of the person with the project and the destination. And this is gonna, it's gonna cause those change mindsets, um, change the mindset that what we are looking for regenerative development, how we can create that ripple effect, the change mindsets from the traveler and, and from the communities and stakeholders. And it's when coming to, I uh, think, Tanner and TTC, Transformational Travel Council, they have this encounter with the transformational, the transformation purpose for the traveler in destinations. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I really appreciate all that. Um, yeah, I want to I want to move into talking about transformational travel here. But before we start talking, I want us all to do a thought exercise, if we can. Um, I want you to think of your most cherished travel memory the one experience that had the biggest impact on your life. Think about what about that experience made it special? Why does it stand out? And how did you feel both in the moment and after you returned home? Now, I want you to think about how that experience might have changed the way you see yourself or the world around you in a positive way. Now, what if travel could be a lever for expanding that impact to the 1.5 billion travelers that embark, embark on journeys every year? How could our lives, our communities, our planet be impacted by a tourism industry living and breathing from a place of wholeness and integration? I really believe this is the power of what we call transformational travel. The fundamental key component here is the outcome of positive change. So how can travel create positive change? Really, it comes from the deepening of connections to self, to others, and to something beyond the self through deep, meaningful, and integrated travel experiences, as Anna touched on. Uh, I'm sure you're all wondering about uh, how we could possibly do that or how that might be true. Well, let me share with you what we have created here at the TTC as our foundational framework for transformation. Anna also mentioned those three relationships that she talks about. How can we deepen and harness those to create positive change? I'd like us also to keep in mind as well with this framework that it can be applied at all levels and in all relationships in travel and even outside of travel, including at a destination level. I wanna to try to keep my descriptions and examples as, as general as I can, recognizing that from a destination perspective, these, these tools can be utilized both for travelers, for travel businesses and providers, as well as for communities within a destination. So this framework is based on the idea that, again, those deeper connections to self, to others, and to something beyond the self are, are a key pathway to positive change through transformation. Specifically, our three pillars are self and spirit, or the practice of introspection, others and bridging or the practice of bridging between people and systems and stewardship or the practice of expansion in order to care for our world. These three contexts encompass not just relationships in travel, but really in all of life itself. Within each context, we can explore different statuses and relationships to each one. As you can see on the diagram, we move in a circle from where I am currently or what is my current state of being into why I travel and how I might plan and prepare to travel. Next, exploring how I go or basically what am I doing while I travel? And finally, how do I return? Uh, which is where we begin to see the true power of those transformational experiences to change the way that we make choices in our lives. At each step along the journey, we'll ask many questions such as, how has my history and upbringing socialized my way of viewing others? How do my habits impact the world around me and how can I change them? 
And what do healthy and reciprocal interactions with others look like? For us here at the TTC, these are really the seeds that sprout into programs, projects, and different ways of exploring travel as a practice and an industry in order to evolve and grow into a new way of being. So as we start to look at some examples, I want you to remember uh, some key things. First, transformational travel is not something that can be sold or commoditized. It really is a process or a way of being and doing as we travel. Because the outcomes of transformational travel depend on an active engagement of the traveler, what we can do is seek to create a vessel for transformation. Now, we can create this vessel through experience designs, through education, through destination management. We can create them through community development and empowerment or through other ways of influencing and interacting with travelers and tourism. Now, if we think about our, our three pillars of transformation, we can see or start to look at some concrete ways in which we can create opportunities for those deeper connections. For example, if we think about self and spirit, it might look like a focus on how we support travelers in preparing for their trip, not just preparing for the trip, but preparing their minds and their hearts for interacting with something that has been designed. In this preparation stage, we can explore what we call the traveler's why or their deeper purpose and motivations behind their decision to travel in the first place. In the end, through engaging with experiences that have been mindfully created with the foundations of that preparatory work, the traveler can discover new ways of seeing themselves as a person, resulting in a new way of being in the world. In the context of others and bridging, what this might look like is a utilization of a tool such as intergroup contact theory, which informs us uh, of the conditions that must exist in order to create healthy and positive connections between people, especially people who are different from each other. So when we seek to connect people in a meaningful way, we're creating opportunities for transformation in all parties involved in the encounter. By creating a space mindfully where healthy conditions are present, we facilitate an opportunity for travelers and those they meet to discover new ways of seeing each other or an expansion of the mind around how we see others. Sort of in its most profound form, these transformational travel experiences can aid individuals in beginning to see themselves in others, especially those who are different from them, which can really lead to a radical shift in human solidarity across cultures and backgrounds. In turn, the choices I make as an individual as I move through my life uh, change and I begin to exist in a new way. So overall, with those couple of specific examples, overall, as we think about tools for transformation, we can generally think about the idea of challenges as a way to stretch and grow into those new ways of being and engaging with the world. Challenges can be both physical or emotional and can impact both travelers and the people and places they interact with along the way. Overcoming those challenges uh, is both, both as an individual and in, in, in a collective setting act as a conduit to a higher level of experience during travel. As we overcome challenges together, we begin to see what is possible and what can be achieved in a new paradigm of travel experiences. So these are just a couple of examples of the ways that as travel designers, destinations, and other tourism professionals, we can begin to think mindfully and deliberately about how we create and craft that vessel for transformation. So lastly, uh, I just wanted to quickly touch on the intersection of sort of these transformational encounters and how we might measure certain outcomes in travel experiences. I know it's important to be able to know whether what we're doing is having the positive impact that we want it to have. So in this way, we have to start thinking about travel and transformational travel as a dual path or a dual approach to creating positive change. One path focused on the personal and interpersonal evolutions through those transformational experiences, resulting in more mindful and conscious individuals who will make choices that are more elevated and more positive in their lives and the lives of others. And the other path focused on transformation of communities, culture, and planet through their interactions with tourism in a more regenerative and holistic way. We can think back to what Malu is saying, uh, and she described the results of the survey in, in, in that disconnection between tourism and the local communities leading to an unhealthy relationship. 
What I mean here is that for too long, communities and local people who are interacting with tourism have been relegated to a passive role in how they develop and execute in tourism practices. A transformational approach at a community level focuses on how we create a new tourism paradigm where communities are the owners and leaders or the protagonists, if you will, in how tourism interacts with land and culture. Without this approach that seeks to engage both aspects of transformation, we'll be missing an opportunity that we have. Now, in order to leverage this and to be able to show that indeed these tools and practices result in more positive outcomes, uh, we have to do some research and collect some data. This is where at the TTC, we are beginning to lay the foundations of a research committee dedicated to engaging our community and the larger tourism community in order to both validate our definition of transformational travel and also aid the industry in understanding how we can achieve our goals of positive change. As our first task or engagement, we'll be seeking to publish a white paper on transformational travel that will be researched and executed in collaboration with our ally community, academic partners, and other nonprofit organizations in the industry. Our hope really is to bring that the industry has some powerful data that can both validate what we're saying and also guide our work in the future. So just to wrap up, uh, I want you to take away from this, if you take nothing else away, take away these three things. First, that transformational travel has the power to create positive change in individuals, communities, and planet through deepening connections in order to create new ways of being and engaging with the world. Two, that executing on the concept uh, as a tool comes in many forms and it's all about how we both stretch travelers in their way of viewing themselves and others, as well as stretching ourselves as a travel industry to reimagine our relationship with communities and the planet. And third, sustainability, regeneration and transformation work in harmony to address the need for travel to behave as a co-creative partner in seeing a future of thriving for our systems and our planet. So thank you for listening. Uh, Manuel, back to you. Thank you, Tana and Anna, and thank you everybody for your attention. We hope that we have helped clarify how the synergy between sustainability, regeneration, and transformational travel shows great potential to improve destinations, their environment, and the quality of visitor and host community experience. Please feel free to reach us anytime directly via the email addresses which are on this slide. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, and um, very inspiring presentation. And, and I hope everybody uh, got an idea, like a basic idea of how all these three um, ways of travel connect. These are not different. These just are complementary ways of uh, enhancing our uh, travel experience or, and our tourism experience in general. Uh, so I will stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, and I would like, because I, I didn't have uh, the chance to look at the chat, uh, Chenge, are there any questions from uh, the participants to start our little discussion before we go to the breakout rooms? Mm. Please, everyone, if you have any questions, post it. I don't see anything at the moment. Let me see. Okay, but uh, in the meantime, uh, while we, we uh, search the, the, the chat, I would like to ask a question to all, all our speakers. So if you can please uh, put your cameras back on, uh, Manuel, Anna, and Tanner, thank you. Um, because I know this is for a lot of people in our industry. These are new concepts. We know these, these are not new practices, right? As Anna mentioned, it's been uh, from the, our, our ancestors, the indigenous communities, all this is the practice that they have developed, right? Uh, along the time and with transformation. Um, but I know also based on different discussions I've been having um, with different partners in Latin America, here in Canada, North America, and in Europe, uh, there is a little bit confusion about the terminology around 
right? Regeneration, transformation, and sustainability, and how all these concepts connect. Um, and someone actually mentioned to me that there have been articles that they mention specifically that regenerative tourism and uh, tourism should replace or is better than sustainable tourism. And that causes confusion, right? So I will just to ask the three of you uh, if you could share your thoughts about this um, uh, this notion. So we can start maybe in the order you all presented. So Manuel can go first, then Anna, and then Tanner. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for this question. It's it's an important one. I've heard the same comments here and there. Um, as far as I'm concerned, terminology is, is not that important. Um, what really counts is the, the intention. Do, do we want tourism to be a force for good? Do we want it to serve the communities, the cultures? Do we want it to uh, support the, the biodiversity and to protect the environment? I think if we can say yes to those questions, then we are probably going in the right direction, whatever name we give it. Um, sustainability is a very valuable tool. It has contributed to raising awareness to the problems and uh, to design some solutions or think of solutions that would be possible. It has offered some tools. Uh, it offers uh, indicators. So it really has a role to play. And I think it will continue to have a role to play. Um, regeneration, um, um, it's different in the way that it aims to create the conditions for life to thrive. Um, and in, this is very, very relevant if we consider the crisis that we are facing right now. Um, sustainability focuses more on elements and maybe more in depth and regeneration is more systemic thinking, seeing the whole, the whole picture. So I would say that they are not rivals and there shouldn't be one that replaces the other. I see them more as complementing each other because if, if we use both, um, we, we can really hope to be able to create a future that is based on abundance of quality rather than abundance of quantity. That's how I see things. Um, Anna, what would be your take on this? <laughs> right, so I think that um, I have been working in sustainability for 11 years, so I'm not against sustainability at all. And I think even working in, and I'm working in sustainability, so I'm not having another hat. So as we said, it's regenerative, regenerative development embrace sustainability. I think we have to move beyond labels. I think labels doesn't help in this industry. I think we are too stuck in fixing about labels and discussing about labels. And what we should go deeper is about what we do, we do it well. We do it with alignment, you know, and, and that deep level that we want to um, put that energy to sustain life. I mean, I have a lot of colleagues and full respect of myself working on sustainability. My energy working with sustainability has been always to have a positive impact in the destination. Um, that itself also is a generation. And per se, it's about um, working with the energy with regenerate life, with gives life to a destination, yeah? So there are a lot of partners in sustainability, my colleagues in sustainability, that they have been working in flower regeneration and they didn't know because it's another level, they were putting that energy to really give life to the destination and they were under the umbrella of um, sustainability. Um, I think that the, as the planet evolves, systems and methodologies and the way the world view how we see life also evolves. And I think this is right. Evolving our worldview, the lens that we human has living in this world is also evolving, and it is right. So, and again, sustainable regeneration embrace sustainability. So, this is how I could I could say it. Yeah, that's great. I think I feel like both of you have addressed that really, really well. I was looking in the chat here, and I feel like. There's a building on uh, uh, this that we can have one of the questions I wanted to kind of pull out if that's okay. 
Um, Tim's question about, this is a really, really good and powerful question um, about how do we implement or how do we get these things going in a destination? It's not just, I love how he says, it's not just, this is, we're going way beyond tourism here. And it's not just about tourism, it's about all sorts of things. And I think this plays into the conversation about regeneration and sustainability and transformation. To me, to, the answer to this question isn't a simple one. And if I had the answer to it, I'd probably be you know, doing something more important with my life. But <laughs> I think that, um, I think it comes down to me is about how, where do we go and how do we, uh, who do we begin giving, you know, tools and support and, and, and power to. I feel like for me, it always starts, our approach to transformation is always that it starts from the inside out. Now that can mean starting from the inside of me as an individual. It can start as inside of me, me and my colleagues as an organization. When we think about destinations, to me, what that really means is we have to look at, at, our, at a destination as an individual or as an entity, right? Communities, local people, how are we bringing those voices in and where do we go and how do we support um, a sort of ground up approach, right? Um, I really do believe in the power of, of if we can shift mindsets, if we can create an opportunity for transformational thinking about myself, as a person and as a community, it begins to change the way that I interact with others. And I think a tourism industry that's guided by individuals in local communities at destinations who are thinking of themselves in that way, then we can have something powerful to go forward with. So that's kind of my opinion about that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and I've, I, I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing more and more questions. Uh, but at this moment, we, we need to stop this piece of the presentation. But right now, uh, the three speakers are moving to the breakout room Q&A with speakers. So I would like to continue with these questions on the chat and more questions that you may have uh, with them in the, in the breakout room. Uh, so uh, I will keep the questions uh, we have here on the chat to continue. Um, so right now, I think yeah, I'm just looking at the time. Um, we are ready to move to those uh, breakout rooms and we'll continue the conversation there. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for staying for our next session. Uh, before giving the floor to Manuel Prunier, who will be the host of the next uh, session with our new panel, for new tools on regenerative tourism. I just wanted to thank everybody again for your participation in the last session. I want to thank also the speakers of the previous uh, session. And uh, it was a great conversation that we had here in the main room, also in the breakout room. Uh, and I know it's a very uh, complex discussion at this point. So I welcome you all to keep the discussion, keep uh, asking questions. And now I will give the floor to Manuel to introduce our new panel. Welcome. Thank you, Bibiana. Hello again, everybody, and uh, welcome to those who joined, who just joined us. I hope that you had exciting conversations in the breakout rooms. Ours were certainly very lively. And uh, I now wish to welcome you to the second session of today's event that will showcase four stories presented by Green Destination representatives from the USA, Africa, and Europe. Some of the presenters will talk about regeneration explicitly. Others will not. And really, words do not matter. We were actually just talking about this in one of the breakout rooms. What matters is the principles that are applied. Regenerative principles often come to us naturally from our own intuition of how to harness tourism potential as a force for good. So I would not be surprised if many of you in the audience realized that you too apply regenerative principles in your work, perhaps without even realizing it. I would now like to welcome our panel. Our guest speakers are Chloe King, from Solimar International in the USA, Luis Val Icarillo from the Development Agency of Bergeda in Spain, Greg Bakunzi from Red Rocks Initiatives for Sustainable Development in Rwanda, and Matea 
Pervetin Koslovic in Slovenia, who will present the Istrian Breakfast Project. Welcome and thank you, Chloe, Luis, Greg, and Matea for participating in this panel. Let's kick off with Chloe King, who is the project manager for Solimar International, a sustainable tourism marketing and consulting firm that works with emerging destinations all over the world. She is also a Marshall Scholar at the University of Cambridge, where she researched emerging practices of regenerative travel and tourism. This was done through a global survey of tourism operators, DMOs, community-based tourism networks, and destinations. She will present the findings of this research, and we are excited to learn more about this. Chloe, the floor is yours for you to share your screen. Thank you so much, Manuel. Let me do that now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, everyone in the audience for attending today and for the, the Green Destinations uh, coordinating team. You've done a fantastic job of organizing this really excellent online conference. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be presenting today. Um, and thank you, Manuel, for giving that background. I don't need to go too much more into um, my own background uh, and who I am. And uh, we'll just launch directly into into the study findings um, of this research titled Beyond Sustainability, a Global Study of Nature-Based Solutions in Regenerative Tourism. So the real purpose behind um, this study as uh, coming from a more academic perspective was to, to situate this term um, and this concept regenerative tourism as a nature-based solution in its own right. And I think uh, this concept of, of regeneration, which we have heard so much about in the past year, um, is really a, a really great way, I think, of, of better centering uh, this notion of social justice, uh, more so in many ways than, than, than what we've seen with the, the discourse around sustainability. Um, this, this term regeneration and, and the practice of regeneration, I think, gives greater agency for local communities to, to bring the life that they aspire for into existence. Um, with this notion of, of regenerative justice involving the explicit and intentional discovery and building of these life meanings, ultimately helping stakeholders and practitioners make choices about what to protect, restore, and let go of explicit and subject to deliberation by these stakeholders. Ultimately, um, in conceptualizing regenerative tourism as a nature-based solution, um, in which nature-based solutions themselves, as defined by the IUCN, are uh, actions to protect, manage, and restore ecosystems in ways that address societal challenges and provide human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Um, it's really critical to acknowledge here that, that while this term regeneration and regenerative tourism um, is one we've been hearing a lot this past year, uh, this, this is not a new concept, and ultimately, um, regener regeneration in general is directly derived from indigenous knowledge and practice, in which a regenerative economy renders the health of humans and nature indivisible from one another. So as we move forward into this space, both as practitioners and academics, um, in order to, to do that, we must be better at situating uh, regenerative practices within indigenous knowledge and practice um, and local communities around the world. Ultimately, I argue that by conceptualizing regenerative tourism as a nature-based solution, this enables us to see tourism not just as a tool for economic development, but actually as an ecosystem-based approach in its own right. What I was able to do through this research process was um, through an extensive systematic review of the literature that is out there at the moment, um, I was able to adapt this IUCN nature-based solutions framework to a regenerative tourism framework which resulted in eight criteria and 28 indicators um, that then were tested and resulted ultimately in, in five primary factors that enabled a shift from sustainable to regenerative tourism. And this was done through uh, semi-structured interviews and uh, quantitative surveys with tourism operators, destinations, um, community-based networks around the world and I'd just like to acknowledge here um, and, and say my thanks to the organizations, the Long Run and the Regenerative Travel Group for helping to facilitate many of these connections. 
So I'll launch into my findings here um, and really just give you an overview of the major findings in each of these eight criteria. It's going to be really rapid fire, so I apologize for um, the sort of academic heavy nature of the research in the end, but hopefully you get something out of it and um, I'll link to the full study uh, later on in the Zoom chat and at the end of this presentation. So the first criteria was how tourism addresses societal challenges and enhances local livelihoods, with many of these operators explicitly stating that they were established in order to address these societal challenges um, and, and ultimately worked with these stakeholders into, in order to address them. Um, many, many acknowledge the importance of, of what some call this history of place uh, in recognizing that regeneration is not just about the natural landscape, but actually thinking about the communities and the social and cultural systems um, that operate within them. The second criteria, tourism design is informed by scale, recognized how many businesses were um, really good at understanding the complex interactions between society, economy, and the ecosystems. Um, and, and ultimately this resulted in this process of, of continuous co-evolution um, and understanding how important these strategies for reflexive and continuous stakeholder engagement are. Um, so creating opportunities for two-way communication between these tourism operators and the communities in which, they, um, in which they reside, whether that was through the establishment of local village councils um, in seats in local DMOs or other ways as well. The third criteria, tourism results in net gained biodiversity with many businesses acknowledging that they themselves were a pro-biodiversity business um, and that the design of these tourism interventions or operators were resulting in net gains to biodiversity. And this really got to the notion that whether it was rewilding or nature-based solutions or, or restoration or protection, um, in the end, it's about being inclusive of the people in, in these areas as well. Um, but biodiversity, I think, is not necessarily the best indicator for success here, because um, as one operator in Australia noted, um, they actually had to trim back biodiversity to respond to some of the crisis and, and as, as climate change is, is causing many of these stressors, um, particularly following the Australian bushfires of last year. The fourth criteria, tourism relies on diverse income streams while helping to diversify local livelihoods. Ultimately, businesses were um, really critical, obviously, in helping to diversify local income streams and helping to directly finance protection and restoration of these ecosystems. Um, but many businesses were uh, falling short on relying on diversified revenue streams beyond tourism themselves, which was obviously a huge challenge in this past year over the COVID-19 crisis when most of the world saw a complete shutdown of this industry. However, a unique finding here is that these respondents retained on average 87.5% of their staff throughout the COVID-19 pandemic um, and were able to re-employ guides or front desk staff in conservation projects, permaculture farms, um, or in other, other areas of the operation, which is so critical to acknowledge that we're not just thinking about diversity of income streams or diversity of local livelihoods within tourism, but also within the operation itself. Um, so we're better prepared for future crisis to strike. The fifth criteria, governance and management of tourism is empowering, educational, transparent, and inclusive. Um, so many operators struggled with this. Uh, I think if not as many um, as, as some were, were had, had established these grievance resolution mechanisms or were explicitly incorporating traditionally excluded groups or upholding tenure rights. Um, but many were, were um, really excellent at providing educational opportunities or informing stakeholders of challenges related to tourism development. Um, but ultimately, education may not even be the right word here because many regenerative tourism operators and practitioners are really good at opening spaces for community collaboration, um, whether you're a community-based network or a high-end exclusive dive resort. Um, by bringing the community into these, these physical spaces that the operator holds, um, this opens up opportunities for mutual information sharing uh, and for, for celebration as well. And this ensures that tourism and its benefits are not just favoring the privileged. The sixth criteria, tourism balances economic, bro ec economic growth, excuse me, with services that sustain and enhance resilience. Um, ultimately looking at the ways in which these operators are able to, to uplift the communities around them and move them forward together. Um, I think this quote is quite illustrative of, that, illustrative of that, 
in that um, it can't just be a, the grass is literally greener on the other side of the tourism fence. Um, you have to be looking beyond the direct business in, in order to understand the overlapping circles of, of development and growth that are, that are possible within this context. The seven criteria tourism interventions are evidence-based and adaptively managed um, was something that many operators struggled with. Uh, monitoring for many of them was a huge weakness and, and many wished that there were some standards or frameworks that could better help in this process. Um, and this is really key to, to emphasize the importance of, of NGO partnerships, as well as certification schemes like that from green destinations that can help enable better monitoring. Um, I think a key takeaway here is, is that operators don't have to do this by themselves. Um, there are many partnerships that, that can happen between national parks, between, um, between uh, NGOs that, that can better enable these things to happen over time. The eighth and final criteria tourism intervention is sustainable and mainstreamed within an appropriate jurisdictional context. Um, this really got the notion that when an operator is successful in creating a regenerative tourism practice um, in, in making this really work in, within that area, um, it can't just happen in isolation. It must trigger this scaling out and scaling up of these interventions. Um, and many operators struggled to uh, facilitate this, this systems change that occurred either within their destination or their area um, or otherwise up through legislative channels. Um, but many of these operators were absolutely critical in the creation and implementation of either protected areas or their management plans. Um, and many of them would not exist without the operators themselves having been there in the first place. Ultimately, this research ended um, through feedback and discussions with all of these different stakeholders and tourism operators. Um, it ultimately ended in a proposed regenerative tourism framework with five core criteria uh, that we hope will help these tourism practitioners, uh, destinations, DMOs, tourism operators, community-based networks, um, whatever space you operate in within tourism, um, we hope that this framework will help to guide you in, in uh, this shift from sustainable to regenerative. With the first criteria looking at how regenerative tourism practitioners can center the community and the community needs first and absolutely foremost. The second criteria uh, is how regenerative tourism practices can improve ecosystem integrity and biodiversity. The third is how they can better embrace diverse and inclusive business models that are ultimately more resilient and help us respond to crises like COVID-19 should one arise again in the future. The fourth criteria is how these interventions are governed in a transparent and just manner. And then the fifth criteria is how regenerative tourism is capable of enhancing these conservation partnerships um, that better help us to protect the ecosystems and the communities um, that, that uh, reside within them. So thank you very much for listening today. Um, and if you would like to uh, have any more details on an upcoming publication of this study um, and, and more uh, research to be released in the future, please feel free to email me or contact me. Um, and you can also head to this link, which I will post in the chat shortly. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Chloe. This was a very enlightening presentation uh, that really enhanced the importance of regeneration for, for resilience. And also we now understand better how some good practices can turn tourism into much more than just a economic development tool and how it can also be an ecosystem, an ecosystem based approach to improve both human well being and the health of biodiversity. So thank you again. And now we are going to Spain with uh, Luis Val y Carrillo who is the president of the Bergeda Development Agency. Uh, this agency created an exciting eco journey, which is called the Seven Faces of Pedraforca Mountain. This project includes regenerative principles, such as collaboration and co-creation with destinations that could have been competitors instead of collaborators, benefits for the community, low impact activities, careful integration of routes in the landscape, and also a strong sense of place 
characterized by connections to nature and ancient cultures. We're excited to explore all this. And uh, Louis, please, it is your turn to share your screen. Thank you very much. And I'm so excited to explain my experience of the uh, Agency of Development Economic of the Territory of uh, Bergeda. Um, Okay, I think I'm seeing my presentation. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, I'm explaining um, uh, the project of the seven phases of Pedra Forca uh, Mountain. Uh, what is the Pedra Forca uh, Mountain? Uh, this is the incredible um, mountain and the uh, best uh, and the best. Um, uh, project uh, for um, explain uh, uh, my uh, local uh, zone. Um, uh, what was uh, our initial problem uh, challenge? Um, we have uh, uh, to, uh, the tourism um, seasonality, summer uh, versus uh, winter, over tourism on the top of the mountain and in some spots. Uh, individual behavior uh, from local stakeholders, uh, uh, lack of cooperative uh, work between public statements and private uh, companies, and not common target and common strategy for the territory, not an international uh, rec uh, recognition. Um, the Pedro Forca Mountain is, uh, is, uh, is the best um, uh, uh, marketing and advertising uh, with a uh, territory. Um, but uh, uh, we don't have uh, an, uh, an strategy uh, for um, uh, doing um, or, or um, um, uh, the, the, the local uh, don awareness um, and economic and explode uh, this uh, mountain. And the project of the seven uh, phases of Pedra Forca uh, is the results um, to uh, attach uh, these uh, these problematics. What uh, what was implemented to solve it? Uh, to create a network of emblematic Mediterranean mountains to tackle in a common to the uh, problems. Uh, we uh, we participate uh, with a network uh, with other uh, countries uh, with the same problem uh, um, and with uh, uh, one element. Uh, uh, common, um, the mountain, the biggest mountain and uh, important mountain, mountains uh, with this uh, country. Um, in the project, uh, we participated uh, uh, nine uh, nine mountains uh, with uh, with uh, with the uh, Europe. Um, to be, um, uh, the objective is creating an, an eco journey on each mountain using the same methodology on the basis of su uh, sustain, uh, sustainable uh, tourism. Um, uh, we are doing um, uh, eco, eco ways, uh, eco journeys, eco, eco ways to, um, to develop uh, another uh, towns um, near uh, the, the mountains. Um, and um, we are doing a uh, tourist product um, to, uh, to, to, to weigh uh, um, another, uh, another, um, another uh, countries. And uh, we have a, a network um, uh, uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, with the travel agencies. Uh, we, we, um, we buy. Um, the, the other uh, with the other uh, eco journeys and uh, we are uh, doing um, uh, 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 the same strategy uh, create a common strategy of communication in a sustainable uh, sustainable tourism uh, leaflet map uh, guide and, uh, and videos um, uh, and in the in the in the YouTube channel with emblematic mountains um, um, you can look in uh, what is the project, uh, what the, what, what's, what's the mountains uh, we participated in the project um, and all the project. Um, which tools and resources uh, we are needed? Um, 
uh, a new European uh, program uh, Interreg made to finance the project for uh, three years, around uh, three uh, million uh, euros um, to, to find, uh, I, uh, sorry, to work uh, with this project. Uh, common methodology explained in a transfer uh, guide uh, addressed to uh, an, another destination management and organizations. It uh, includes uh, five steps. Uh, first step, involvement of a local uh, stakeholders. Design the eco journey under uh, the theory attributes agree between all mountains around five uh, different uh, topics. Um, uh, three, implementation uh, of the eco journey and the ground according to specific needs and rules of each uh, territory. Um, fourth, uh, creation of a tourism product addressed to different targets on the, uh, the eco journey. Uh, and finally, to improve and monitoring uh, continuously uh, the, the eco journey. Which results uh, have we noted so far? Uh, new tourism offer and new uh, products uh, of tourism uh, with this uh, local uh, for visitors avoiding overcrowded sports and optimizing infra infrastructures and equipment to increase uh, the sustainable uh, awareness of tourism agents and visitors, very important, to create a network of a local stakeholders uh, to work in, in common. Uh, and new opportunities on European uh, projects um, because um, now uh, we continuously the project um, with um, uh, with another with another uh, countries um, to participate with the partners um, and uh, international uh, uh, recognition. Uh, this is the, the, the partners and uh, participated uh, in the project. Uh, we are looking uh, uh, for a Spain uh, and Balearic Iceland, uh, Pedra Forca with my local uh, zone, uh, France from Canigo um, uh, and, and Saint Victoire, uh, Italy, uh, Gran Sasso, uh, Eletna, uh, uh, Albania, uh, and uh, finally, um, uh, Greece for Olymp Olympus uh, and uh, Creta uh, Silorities uh, Ido. Um, this is the, the little uh, practice. Um, we have a, a good uh, a good experience um, to work uh, about the same uh, tools um, to do uh, an eco journeys. Um, it has a similar uh, eco journeys in. Uh, in other uh, parts of uh, Europe and for doing, uh, for doing this uh, network um, uh, emblematic uh, mountains uh, and the similar um, um, tools uh, of, of work. Um, and it's very, uh, um, and the more important, uh, we are created um, a new, uh, a new uh, product, um, a tourist product for a for a zone and uh, uh, and, uh, and the initial uh, position, um, uh, it don't have uh, any 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 situation uh, to to recognize um, development economic um, for uh, this uh, mountain because the initial uh, only people to hiking on the top uh, and 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 people uh, um, goes to uh, to home and don't do don't do uh, doing anything uh, in the in the in the towns around uh, the mountain. With this eco journey around uh, the mountain, um, we develop um, uh, the other zone, um, and it's not necessary to hiking on the top. Of the mountain, uh, because the people uh, don't have a physical condition um, to, to hiking on the top, and, and, and doing uh, this eco journey, uh, this eco journey, um, people um, um, uh, brings uh, the 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 other uh, uh, the the landscape, uh, the same landscape. Um, um, uh, who people uh, to, um, to to hiking on the on the top of the of the of the mountain? 
um, thank you very much. Uh, if we have uh, uh, any uh, questions, uh, it have a uh, uh, here it have uh, um, uh, my email. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis, for this uh, superb example of international and local collaboration around mountain tourism. And uh, you really showed how collaboration can help in difficult conditions. It, uh, you also showed the importance of sharing ideas for new offerings for visitors and um, good practices that lead to tourism success. So thank you again. Now let's go to Rwanda with uh, Greg Bakunzi, who is the founder and CEO of Red Rocks Rwanda. Red Rock Rwanda is a nonprofit organization who supports community based tourism to improve lives and the environment locally. This idea of using tourism to improve local conditions is fundamental to the regenerative approach. Also, Red Rocks considers that the success of a community and the health of its environment are inextricably linked. This is yet another regenerative way of approaching tourism, an excellent illustration of the shift from seeing humanity as an exploiter of nature to humanity as part of nature and striving for its success. Greg, the floor is yours. Uh, a very, thank you very much and good afternoon from Rwanda. Um, I'm really great to be uh, a part of this uh, presentation that is going to be going on this afternoon. Um, and I, I'm a bit sorry, but we are not meeting physically face to face as we used it to do. Uh, but uh, I'm really confident and happy that everybody is going really um, to listen to what we are presenting this afternoon. Uh, without going, I would like to share with you uh, our our, our slideshow so that everybody can be able to see um, what we have been really doing uh, here and how we have really worked hard to see how what can we do, uh, we do better than what we used to do in the past. Uh, as Manuela has said, Red Rocks Initiative is a non-profit organization uh, that has started with intention of like trying to see what can be done or what can we develop uh, uh, as a in terms of community-based tourism in our region. Uh, and since we started this program, a lot of organizations and other stakeholders uh, have really come uh, to join us. Without taking too much uh, of our time, uh, I would like to go through uh, a bit of how uh, this nonprofit organization came in. Uh, what is developed through the nonprofit organization, it starts as an initiative. And once it's being developed, it's taken a, a straight away to Red Rocks Rwanda uh, Eco Tours, which is a social enterprise. And this way it can really like sustain it for a, a long time. So in a brief, Red Rocks Rwanda is an ecotourism, um, is an ecotourism company and a social enterprise that is all about the community, the wildlife tourism and travel that's promoting sustainable tourism. Any idea, anything that is related to sustainable development, to community-based tourism, we bring it uh, under the non-profit organization we boil it together after little you know, boiling it together with our community members because we always want to make sure that we involve them because they are going to own what we are doing. So we try always to bring everything uh, together and have a, a very discussion with uh, all the stakeholders uh, that are, are with us. And it's through promoting sustainable tourism, community and culture programs, our pioneer culture tourism scheme promoting our nature preserve uh, through uh, tourism. Red Rocks Eco Tours brings underserved community into the, uh, the, supply, the tourism supply chain and the supports development projects that help people to help themselves. We have come up with different uh, initiatives 
that have also not only come straight from the local communities, but also comes from us. And then we try to see which angle can we turn them in so that uh, other members or uh, other communities can also be attracted. We are not only focusing on the cooperatives that we are working with, but we are also focusing on the communities that are in the area that we operate in, in general. So that's some of the things that we are using in uh, our initiative as we try to see how can we go back to work and with new projects. And that's where we say that great vision needs great partners. We are working in to see, to build collaboration partnerships with other stakeholders so that we can, we are able to meet our goals. Um, when it comes to social and economic impact on, uh, of COVID in Rwanda, tourism as one of the sector most affected by, um, but most affected by the COVID pandemic. Uh, even our organization, our communities were really affected by that. But we didn't give up. We kept on like carrying on some workshops. We kept on like carrying on some discussion with the stakeholders. Uh, we created more uh, community activities and programs to keep them in a space. The idea was to see, to give them a hope that things are going to turn up to be good because all what we were doing, all our projects, all our activities were built under the tourists that we are coming in. Um, and one thing I won't even say uh, it was a kind of like uh, maybe a mistake or something we didn't even realize. We depended too much on foreign tourists rather than people from the region and this was not the right thing. Uh, so with this, after realizing this, we thought it's time now also to see how can we focus also on the region domestic tourism. With this way, we sat down with the community members and we started like developing some uh, community events that are learning uh, from Monday up to Sunday. So like that, so meaning that every day, at least we have something going on. Um, I will be able to share this with you uh, after uh, our, uh, after my presentation. Um, when, uh, when we come to, we, we, we use the sustainable tourism to preserve and improve the management of the resources in this land of a thousand years. That's how they call it. They call Rwanda, it's a country of a thousand years. We have so many hills around us. Not only hills, but we are also surrounded by some volcanoes. Uh, for those who have been to Rwanda, they might have seen them, but we are just in the northern part of Rwanda, which is um, two hours drive from our capital. And we are surrounded by almost six different volcanoes. So we are, Rwanda is also being bordered with four countries. We have, so we have Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Congo, Burundi, and then we have got also Tanzania, which is bordering us. Uh, we took sustainable, uh, sustainability one step further and focused on looking at the social and cultural benefits. Our action included ways to protect the characters in country places to develop programs to, to ascenic Rwandan culture, to promote environmental preservation, and among other visitors members to promote agro-tourism in Rwanda and to invest in community programs, which will really data depends on the tourism resources income for the local communities. Uh, I have to say like 90, like 87 percent of uh, the population in Rwanda are more uh, uh, engaged in farming, they are farmers. But then this type of farming they are doing, it's not going to sustain. The land is not that big. It's, we have a small country with almost a certain million people. And then we are trying to see how can we move from the agri agro agriculture or how can we use the agro-tourism um, as a part of its also uh, like complementing on what our grand and the grandparents have been engaged in in terms of uh, um, agriculture or incoming generating projects. Uh, resources we use to regenerate tourism. 
During the lockdown, measures were preserved our natural resources, climate, landscape, ecosystem, cultural resources, urban heritage, arts and ecology sites, and tough our younger generation about the cultural tradition which will show to visitors once tourism recovers. We kept on seeing where can we touch which kind of cultural preservation have, and have, uh, have we not touched on so that we can turn it to be um, a community-based tourism. And then as soon as that comes in, we, as soon as the tourism industry comes back, then we are able uh, to move on with new program, new products that will be also shared. More, uh, so when, uh, without taking much time, um, uh, I know we have a short time, uh, I'm just going to conclude by our roadmap. Uh, we, we, uh, our road, our roadmap to regenerating tourism in Rwanda needs us. It needs, it doesn't only need Greg, it doesn't need only those people who are involved in the, in the cooperatives, but it also needs some stakeholders, also some government institutions, like any government institution is, which is also connected to, um, to the tourism industry, like the Rwanda Development Board and private sector should also be coming in. Uh, we need also to boost the uh, competitiveness and build the resilience, including economic diversification with promotion of domestic and regional tourism. This is where I have, uh, I said uh, in the, um, in my first presentation, I said, we focused on foreign tourists, but we didn't really think of domestic and regional tourism. And that was a kind of research. Now we are trying to see how can we stick into the region and domestic tourism. And that's where we came up with different uh, programs. We are different events that are going on from Monday up to Sunday, as I have mentioned. And I will be able to share this with you later so that you can see where we want to start and how we want to really to think more people to be coming to um, our area also and uh, uh, spend more time, but without also like coming in we are like once in a while, but also we have like some sustainable events uh, that will be able to let the locals sell their products. We let also other people come for that and we, they are also able to demonstrate their music, art, and their other stuff. Uh, coordination and partnership to restart and transform sector towards achieving the SDGs, ensuring tourism restarts and the recovery puts people first to work together to ensure this. We have seen that without partnership, without collaboration, without working with the, uh, the organization like the Green Destination, uh, I don't think we are really going to make this happen. All what we need is to bring all our hands together, work together, and see how can we exchange, how can the people from Spain, from Peru, uh, from North America, work really together, and then we see who, you know, everybody can learn from one another, and then from this learning experience, that we will be able really to sustain the community-based tourism. We will be able to bring back um, the tourism on the world map, as it seems it might have really gone uh, a bit far, but we still have a hope. And we think that through collaboration, partnership, and different presentations around the world, we will open people's minds uh, as we know that even though the tourism will come back, it might not come back like the way how it used it to be, uh, especially in the African continent, uh, where most of the people to come for game drives, safaris, hiking, but they are coming in, they are, are going to be traveling for a purpose. And now we are trying to develop more reasons, more purposes that are connected to what could be uh, bringing even the international tourists without leaving uh, behind the domestic and the region tourism um, to be visiting us. Thanks very much. And I really I see, I appreciate taking your time and uh, I look forward to have you visiting us very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. You have really shown the regenerative potential 
of asking the right questions, of encouraging active community involvement, even those who are not directly involved in tourism, to build flexibility and resilience in times of crisis, and also to be engaged in environmental protection. You make me dream of going to Rwanda, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. And we look forward to learning more in the question time. Last but not least, we are going to taste the Istrian breakfast with Matea Hervetin Koslovic. Matea is an entrepreneur and the president of a tourism cooperative in Slovenia. The Istrian breakfast is a new business model that relies on regenerative principles such as collaboration and the co-creation of solutions, and also the use of a shared economy to include small producers who could not otherwise participate in tourism. In addition, there is a strong emphasis on deepening the connection between visitors, their hosts, and the local culture, and on enhancing the cultural identity. Matea, we are excited to listen to you. Thank you very much. Okay, I will start to share the screen. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, today I'm going to present our tourist product, Easter and Breakfast, uh, a local experience. My name is Matea and I'm coming from Slovenia or more uh, precise from Slovenia and Istria and I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, so today I'm going to explain also how we get to the product. Maybe it will be interesting for some, some of you to listen how it was the process of, de of developing such a product. And maybe you will get some ideas how to implement also uh, in your destinations. So I'm going to explain the challenge uh, then about the product, the innovative business model and uh, uh, the finals. So how it's actually starting and um, the idea, it was developed with the University of Primorska. So several students were actually helping us um, to have um, these ideas and the final product. And it was uh, co-financed with the Ministry of Education, Science and Sports. And it was also as a result of the first tourist hackathon under the uh, Slovenian Tourist Board. So how it actually started, we made the research of uh, different local uh, stakeholders in the area of the Slovenian Istria, and uh, we, um, we take the one more directly and indirectly connected link to the tourism industry. So the first level, uh, level were the accommodations. Um, as we know, the sharing economy is, is rapidly increasing, so the number of rooms, uh, apartments is uh, growing and more and more people are searching their uh, way uh, to be involved in the tourism, also with offering their own accommodations. But there is a lack because um, they actually do, the most of them do not do this as a professional one, so, uh, so they lack of time and if Actor, usually they not uh, they not offer any additional service. Uh, so here we found a big gap to fill it. Then uh, we took the local farmers, or better, the smaller uh, pro producers in the area, which are actually very important because they are the, the one who maintain the gastronomic the, the gastronomical identity of our reg region, and they produce the genuine product. But due to their uh, limited capacity, they are usually not able to sell uh, their uh, products in the big uh, trading chains, for example. And then here we have the local experiences, so the providers of it. Uh, usually they are um, smaller providers who don't have big uh, marketing budgets, so they do not really do big promotions. And uh, they also cannot uh, welcome big uh, groups of people, but they have a limited, they, they can accept a limited number of visitors. And so we put uh, our ideas and this is how it started. Uh, it came out the product, the Easter and breakfast, a local experience. So the Easter and breakfast is actually a nutritionally balanced breakfast prepared for uh, two people uh, and is made exclusively from local products of the local farmers in our area. So it means kilometer zeros. 
and they're really like um, genuine uh, product and uh, uh, completely seasonal. So the Easter and breakfast uh, is delivered to the small tourist rooms, apartments, and accommodations throughout um, the Slovenian Istria. And how it actually works. So the guest or even the owner of the accommodation can order the breakfast by phone or by the website. Uh, there you have to tell uh, where are they located in which uh, accommodation. They can choose which breakfast they do prefer because we have different classic vegetarian and also family version. Uh, then they decide the way of payment, cash or card, the hour of delivery, which is subjective because it depends. Uh, we usually take one hour uh, of free time like uh, between seven eight eight and nine nine and ten because of the logistic operations and we kindly ask them to book it uh, at least for one day in advance till 8 p.m for the next day uh, all the packages uh, in which are delivered uh, the breakfast is exclusively eco-friendly packages and um, furthermore we will see also how we kindly ask to uh, recycle so these are some of the apartments of the guest houses that we are delivering every day. Uh, the breakfast, as you can see, they are uh, like smaller accommodations, but very well uh, organized. And also um, they, um, they have the idea um, and the wish to um, offer to their guests uh, something more than just an ordinary uh, accommodation. And this uh, here you can see also how it is actually um, uh, the which information they get when they uh, get the breakfast. So everything each farmer is uh, presented. Um, there is the description. It's also the address where they can find them. So if you really like, for example, the goat yogurt that you had for the breakfast, you can go to the farm and buy the, there directly. It's also explain how they are doing this and also all the allergics, uh, allergy and everything. But uh, actually, that's not, uh, it's not uh, just about good food, it's much more, because the guests uh, receive when they order the breakfast also uh, five local experiences, in a way, for free, which gave them the possibility to meet the local people and discover the gastronomy and cultural heritage of the local community. So here you have the examples of what they do, what they can actually do in the Slovenian Istria when they get the coupons. They can go for organic wine tasting. They can visit the uh, herbal labyrinth. They can go for a tasting of the dry fruits and discover the highest waterfall uh, in Slovenian Istria. They can go for the wine, uh, um, olive oil tasting. And they also can visit the city tower in Copper uh, because also the Municipality of Copper found the idea as a good one, and also uh, they uh, joined the partners. So, how is the process? They order the Istrian breakfast, as um, explained before. They get uh, coupons uh, for the experiences. Uh, they directly contact the local providers of the experience, and they then visit the locals, and of course, they enjoy. Um, and here you can see how it is organized. Uh, so this is the other side of the brochure. So here you can see how, uh, which are the experience, uh, where are located on the map. Uh, here are the local suppliers. As said before, they can go there and buy directly their place. Here it's a QR code with explanation how to properly recycle. Um, and there is something about uh, our beautiful Istria in Slovenia. So how it is, it's actually, it's, um, it's a business model uh, which is based on the principle of the shared economy and is completely inclusive. Um, in the light of this, a network of the different local providers through the project uh, were, um, uh, were made, was, was established and um, to support, as I said, the small producers and the small partners uh, and uh, improve the local community. But what is the what what was actually the adding value if we are now uh, go through? So with the Istrian breakfast, there is um, an added value for accommodation providers. Uh, so as I said before, we found a lot of uh, chances, uh, or maybe we can say possibilities, how to improve and uh, how to um, how to do better. 
so the tourists, um, the accommodation found out that uh, it's a good idea to have an additional service, uh, which it means an added value uh, for them. The local farmers, uh, actually, we are in this uh, mod in this business model. We are supporting this. Uh, and the local families are able to raise their quality of life because we guarantee every day we are buying from um, their production, what they are growing. We are asking them uh, what we need more. Uh, we are thinking about ideas, how we can, what we can grow for the next season, which products maybe also um, to, um, uh, to try to find out uh, something about how the main season and so on. And then you have the, the providers of the local experiences, which, as I said, we are doing a lot of promotions, and these are usually the, usually the less known experiences. And after running uh, the, pro the project Easter and Breakfast, we found out um, by um, evolving the situation that the guests who are actually coming to uh, their place using the coupon of the Easter and Breakfast spent approximately between 40 and 60 euro for a visit. Uh, so they are actually, mm, they're actually very happy because they also found out that for them, it's important that people get to know about, about their offer, about uh, their place. And as I said before, we are talking about small uh, local providers who are open for two guests and not waiting for a group, but they open their doors and they are happy to have people there. So when we're talking about the future, we are wondering how it will be. Uh, we are sure that the memories uh, are made uh, not only of amazing uh, sunsets or uh, amazing uh, environment, but also through meeting new people, hearing their stories and discovering a new piece of the world and ourselves. And this is the main goal of uh, traveling, of course, in a sustainable uh, way. So that is how we imagine our future and what we are actually already doing in the first place, supporting the local community. Because if we are satisfied uh, with the tourism that we are running, that the guests will be even more. And here you have our contacts. Please uh, join our uh, Facebook, our Instagram, check our offer and welcome to Slovenia. Cheers. Wonderful and very appetizing photos of this breakfast too. So thank you very much, Matea, for sharing with us how the simple idea of a breakfast based on local ingredients and culture can foster new relationships at all levels, create authentic experiences for visitors, improve livelihoods, and create a stronger sense of place. It was very enlightening and useful to understand how this whole project was developed. So again, a big thank you to the four inspiring speakers who shared with us their projects based on regenerative principles. I am sure that the audience has lots of questions to ask on your various projects. And we are now going to move to the questions and answers panel to carry on this exciting discussion. So I will ask the four speakers to turn on their cameras and to unmute. And I will pass the floor on to Bibiana Kala, who will facilitate this panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, and thank you to all the speakers. Really, really exciting to hear all your examples and experiences, and we, I'm sure we all learn from them a lot. Um, so I would like, I'm going to check if we have any um, questions on the chat. Um, I have, I think we have a few. Uh, Sorry, I'm just going through. Uh, okay, so we have a question um, for Matea uh, from Tabito. Uh, why do you offer only breakfast, not lunch or dinner or a picnic set? 
Thank you very much for the question. Actually, the picnic set is uh, is now on the way, yes. Uh, and, but on the other hand, then we decide to be focused on the breakfast and not offering the dinner and on, and on the uh, lunches because um, we decided to be, um, we, we found out that nobody was actually preparing such a breakfast in a way that uh, we were thinking and there were there was a gap and we were, we were prepared to fill this gap and we found the opportunity to develop such a product. So uh, on the other hand, then there is enough space for other restaurant, professional restaurant or cantina, as we say in, uh, in our place, uh, you know, for the local farmers, they open also um, their places for the weekends and sell also others, other um, products. So uh, it was an opportunity and of course there is enough space for everyone for working. Thank you, Matea. Um, and I'm uh, also looking at the chat to see we have more questions. While we wait for other questions, um, I have some from my own. So I would like to ask Chloe, actually, very interesting uh, methodology and framework. Uh, you mentioned at one point a shift from sustainability to regeneration. Uh, so would you describe how you see this shift exactly? What would be the difference between the, the approaches? Yeah, a really good question. Um, and one that I think the, the industry as a whole is really very strongly considering and, and focusing on at the minute. Um, and I think that if you are not uh, kind of diving deeper into a lot of the, the thought leadership that's coming out around this um, or, or know very well some of the, the um, you know, indigenous knowledge and practice that has led to a lot of the, these, these terms and, and understandings. Um, I think it's really difficult to miss the, the distinction between the two because it is, um, you know, it's, it's easy for us to, I think, continue use this term regenerative, regenerative to describe these uh, very similar sustainability initiatives. But um, what I see the, the regenerative shift as being is, is really a, a holistic shift. So looking at, um, you know, tourism as, uh, so Michelle Holiday is, is very famous within this um, discourse in, in living systems thinking. So understanding, um, you know, a tourism community, not just as a, a business and not just as a, um, you know, a singular homogenous community, but as a living system in which all of these different aspects of, of our world um, from nature to communities, to culture, to history, um, interact and, and, and shape the way that we experience development and the way that we experience um, um, tourism as well. So I think that um, by shifting over to a more holistic viewpoint of what tourism is um, and not seeing it just as this economic development approach um, and then understanding that um, you know, this concept of, of regenerating something is, is, is bringing new things into existence. So it's not just sustaining what we, what we have currently. Um, and I think we're all very much aware um, with the many impending ecological crises that we have um, going on at the moment that, that sustainability really isn't enough. Um, and, and I think regeneration really gets at that concept of, of what does it mean to have a radical transformation of these economic systems. Um, Kate Rosworth, I think is another great, um, great economist in, in this space uh, who created the, the donut economics theory um, where, which is now being widely employed in, in cities like Amsterdam to, to really shift the script um, in terms of what economic development should achieve. Um, so, you know, I think it's very hard sometimes to imagine these very ab abstract concepts and actually put them into practice, um, certainly, but I think, I think the term regeneration uh, requires us to be, to really embrace that, that, um, that notion of, of holistic development um, and also the, the possibilities for transformation as well, um, and not just uh, seeing this as a, as a linear approach to, to development. Great, thank you, Chloe. And actually, yes, that's why I, I have a, a few questions for each one of the um, speakers to talk about that. Um, what you mentioned is like an abstract concept, uh, concept at the moment, but I see in each one of your examples, and a, and a concrete application of the regenerative uh, principles. So I would like to start with Lee, Louise. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm checking at the chat. We don't have some uh, new questions yet. Uh, so I will keep going. 
uh, for the few minutes we have here. Um, so Luis, you mentioned at the beginning uh, that you have some big challenges in uh, cooperation. You, you had a lack of cooperation. But then the result at the end is having a big network, uh, you share a methodology and you have a common strategy. And collaboration is one of the principles uh, that we talked today. So I wanted you to explain a little bit more about how you um, overcome this challenge and actually created this big network with this uh, big example of collaboration. Um, sorry, Bibiana, I think Luis uh, has left the call. Oh, okay. So I will leave that question <laughs> open uh, for everybody uh, to think about that, like cooperation, right? And co-creation of solutions is one of the principles. And I've seen it in all the examples we, we saw today. So uh, Greg, also, I have another question for you. Uh, so maybe before I jump into the question, is Greg still on the call? Yeah, I'm here. OK, perfect. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I love your community-based tourism example. Very powerful uh, example. And you mentioned uh, in, in, in your presentation that you took uh, a step further, right? That you you took sustainability a step further in promoting the authenticity of your culture. So I would like you to expand a little bit of, uh, a little bit more on this. How you uh, kind of perpetuate and promote this uh, authenticity of the Rwandanese culture. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, everybody that is in the room this afternoon. Uh, one thing, one step, when we say we took the step forward, uh, there are people who have also taken steps in Spain, in Peru, in Costa Rica, different places of the country. But according to what we have uh, seen, and according to what is going on like in our country in Rwanda, uh, we have to say that Red Rocks Initiative has taken a certain step. We go down in the village, we dig the real culture from the ground, we read the experiences from the ground, and then we bring it up on the map and we put it up on our website. So we try to really create something which is more unique. We always try to be uniqueness in what we are doing. Even though so, other people will be also like seeing what we are doing, but in order to be really to take a step forward is to pick a leaf from let's say uh, what uh, Chloe has presented. And after picking a certain leaf from her presentation, we try also to implicate here, but we also try to see what does, what do we have that goes exactly what Chloe mentioned in her presentation. And then we try to implicate it. So we try to dig, we have done some partnership. So I think we have done some, we have taken a step where we have built like some connections and also being in a, a conversation like what we have been going on since Monday up to now, uh, there is a lot that we have learned from different presentations that have been coming from Philippines, Peru, whenever who, everybody that did a presentation, we could pick something that we can implement here. And that's how we have taken a step forward uh, but through our collaboration, but we also act on the ground. And the more we act, our name keeps on going up. So that's how we have come up to, uh, to take a step forward by getting the right uh, points, the right names to give to our tourism products that we, uh, we are trying to initiate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, amazing how, how you have worked towards a more cohesive uh, work with your community, but in the in a overall and, and international cooperation. So thank you very much. And and we have a question. Um, I have we have a, a couple of questions uh, on the chat now. Uh, but um, let me just uh, okay. We have another question for Chloe. You emphasize that regenerative tourism has roots in indigenous practices. Do you have plans to collaborate with members from a specific indigenous group or groups in the future to develop your concept or further initiatives? 
Yeah, really, really excellent question, Andrea. Thank you for that. Um, and, and absolutely, yes, I think this, this research initiative was sort of a, a preliminary study. Um, and, and while it did feature a number of, of community-based um, tour operators and, and, and networks as well, um, and as well as local indigenous leaders, it was uh, also featured a, a large number of foreign tourism operators as well. Um, so I think it's really critical that we, we take this into a, a community-based tourism context and, and really test the framework there um, and see what other information um, comes out of that. And so the next stage of this research will be um, hopefully a collaboration with the group Planetera, which uh, they run a, a large number of, or have a network of, of community-based tourism operators around the world. Um, so we'll work through them to uh, facilitate some of those channels and and doing some uh, similar data gathering. So interviews and um, and and the surveying as well with with these groups to see how um, how this applies. And then I'm also uh, you know continue to be a, a student as well. So very very eager to. Um, sort of apply this directly in the field um, beyond remote data gathering um, and, and certainly would love to hear any ideas of, of anyone in this audience as well. Um, so do feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, Chloe. And yeah, again, we see the importance of collaboration with all communities, right, in our territories. Um, just looking, uh, so thank you very much, Andrea. I, for, I forgot to acknowledge who, who made the question. Uh, so thank you for this question. And we have a couple of minutes before we move to the breakout rooms. So I will just to ask, uh, um, oh, actually, just one new question uh, for Greg uh, from Andrea. Could you elaborate more on your agrotourism product and any tips for that? She's really interested in knowing more about your Let agrotourism more product. Your, uh, elaborate more on your agrotourism product. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, when we talk about agro-tourism products, as I have mentioned in my presentation, that almost 87% of uh, the population in Rwanda are farmers. They depend on farming. But we are trying also to see what can supplement their farming. Uh, let's say, for example, you have seen what uh, uh, Mateja has just like, presented. Whatever she presented was from the agro-tourism, it's from the locals. And now we are trying also to see how can we get the tourists to be going also on the ground and test what has been grown by the locals? And most of those smaller farms that are being owned by the locals, they don't even use any kind of uh, fertilizer because it's more expensive for them. So all their food is more organic because their soil is still really good. And we encourage the people, we even encourage our guests to go and do that but also participate in the agro-tourism business that the locals have been going on uh, for a long time. You might be eating, for example, like a bread, but you don't know where the wheat comes from. So it's always good. We always take uh, some of our guests. We take them to show them where the wheat is coming from. We show them where the peanuts are being, get, where they get them from. If time permits, you also spend time with them. So this kind of agrotourism, it's not only about testing, it's also about physical fitness because they go there with the whole, they spend like six hours working in a farm and using a machine. It's, they are not using a machine, they are using a hole. So which is also a part of the physical fitness to someone who really wants even to do the exercise. So it's from testing, physical, test, uh, physical fitness to experiences and also text. They are testing and also knowing where the crops that we normally use in our supermarkets comes from. That's how we are using that. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, and there is so much to learn, yes, about the, uh, this agriculturism world. So uh, yeah, whomever is interested, you can contact Greg to learn more about their experience. Um, right now, uh, we're close to, to uh to close the session for today uh so we know some of you need to go at a i'm just looking at my local time sorry so 4 30. <laughs> um, so now we're I, i'm going to just uh, uh share with you a few takeaways and we'll give the floor uh to albert salman to give some closing remarks and after we will have the breakout rooms for those who can stay with our speakers to continue this conversation because there, I know there is more questions coming. 
Um, so for now, I just want to thank, I think one more, once more to all the speakers uh, from today's session, to the first and second panel. Uh, as I mentioned before, we know uh, the, there's uh, many questions about these new approaches, how all work together. So as we mentioned through the day, uh, we can see the synergies between sustainable tourism, regenerative tourism, and transformational travel. We all work together from, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just a systemic approach we need to take to all these, uh, uh, to combine all these elements. And we need to start with questions. That is one, a big takeaway. As a traveler or as a destination or as a business uh, in the tourism industry, the important, uh, something very important that I take away from this all these presentations is we need to start with the right questions and ask ourselves how conscious we are in our, um, in our activities. And we don't need to get stuck in terminologies. There are different terms, different concepts, some new will come, but it's just working from the principles. Learn from those principles and apply those principles to our daily activities. Again, from a tourist perspective or as a tourism provider or a destination. And keep working in those, in, in enhancing those three relationships that we have seen in the different presentations today with ourselves to learn how to be a more conscious traveler and to how to share this uh, in, uh, information and knowledge with others, with others to make more meaningful connections when we travel. And if you are, for example, an uh, experienced designer, how through those experiences are we creating those true connections with the local community, with ourselves? Uh, are there spaces for us to reflect on ourselves and our role in, 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 in our world, in, us, in our community? And of course, the connection with nature. Seeing nature as, a, uh, as, as one, with us. We're not separate, but we are actually one with nature. Uh, so again, just this systemic uh, approach. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank everybody again for participating today. And now I would like to give the floor to Albert for the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Bibiana, for this really inspiring uh, presentation and session. And, and thank you, everybody, for, for contributing to that. Yeah, closing statements. Um, that's for the conference as a whole. And I, I, I hope you won't walk away because we still have the breakout rooms and in the cafe. So for all of us and for millions around the world, it is the challenge of our lifetime to support and facilitate the recovery of tourism in the face of the global, global crisis. The COVID crisis is not the only threat to the livelihoods of many millions. The climate crisis is already having a huge impact on numerous places, and it will also have its future implications to travel, urging us to fly less and travel less far, and definitely not into space. The climate crisis is closely connected to the air pollution crisis and the biodiversity crisis, and also to global deforestation. All this is destroying places and makes tourism less attractive, which is also true for the plastic pollution crisis. We have serious issues regarding social justice and global inequality, and on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Many millions of people are still denied basic human freedoms, not only the right to travel, but also the right to live in peace, freedom, and social justice according to their own traditions and religion. As a result, only a small part of the world's population has access to travel. We are among the lucky ones. But big industry is following us, following us everywhere. We are all subjects of global surveillance, followed by Facebook, WhatsApp, and WeChat, and what have you and we are becoming surrounded by even taller 4G and 5G towers, spoiling landscapes in even the remotest places. The combination and magnitude of the global crisis is worrying. But still, we are happy about the 100 destinations that joined our awards and certification program. And with the 160 destinations that shared with us their good practices, 
to share with the world. But there are more than 100,000 destinations. And scientists tell us that none of these places will escape the climate breakdown. So we hope that all of you will help us to promote the principles of the Green Destination Standard to ensure sustainability as a very minimum. Because sustaining places is no longer enough. We see many systems already collapsing in this time of crisis that are only beginning. I hope we will inspire more and more people to make a difference and to support regeneration and transformation. And we hope more and more destination managers will be open to assess their own role, to assess where they are on the path to a tourism that will truly become a force for good. This week, Green Destinations has tried to promote and to provide some more tools to help you in these challenges, like the Star Toolkit and our training programs of us and our partners, as shown today. Today, we announce a cooperation between Green Destinations, the Regional Lab for Travel, and the Transformational Tourism Council. We are committed to work together in improving the Star Toolkit and other programs by adding their excellent tools, and I hope you will make use of them. Let's start today. And our many hopes can bring a perspective into a future of tourism, which is better. We are truly, truly looking forward to work actively with all of you in making a change. Finally, a big thanks to the event organizers, Cenke, Teresa, Stephanie, Helena, Franca, and many more in the Green Destinations team and partnership. Green Destinations is looking forward to seeing many of you soon and latest at next year's Global Green Destinations Days combining hopefully live and remote participation. Thank you all for attending and enjoy the Green Destinations Cafe rooms. Thank you. <laughs>